Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. Part One, Chapter One. On an exceptionally hot evening early in July, a young man came out of the garret in which he lodged in S. Place and walked slowly, as though in hesitation, towards K. Bridge. He had successfully avoided meeting his landlady on the staircase. His garret was under the roof of a high, five-storied house, and was more like a cupboard than a room. The landlady who provided him with garret, dinners and attendants lived on the floor below, and every time he went out he was obliged to pass her kitchen, the door of which invariably stood open. And each time he passed the young man had a sick, frightened feeling, which made him scowl and feel ashamed. He was hopelessly in debt to his landlady and was afraid of meeting her. This was not because he was cowardly and abject, quite the contrary, but for some time past he had been in an overstrained, irritable condition, verging on hypochondria. He had become so completely absorbed in himself and isolated from his fellows that he dreaded meeting not only his landlady but anyone at all. He was crushed by poverty but the anxieties of his position had of late ceased to weigh upon him. He had given up attending to matters of practical importance. He had lost all desire to do so. Nothing that any landlady could do had a real terror for him. But to be stopped on the stairs, to be forced to listen to her trivial, irrelevant gossip, to pestering demands for payment, threats and complaints, and to rack his brains for excuses, to prevaricate, to lie. No, rather than that, he would creep down the stairs like a cat and slip out unseen. This evening, however, on coming out into the street, he became acutely aware of his fears. "'I want to attempt a thing like that, and am frightened by these trifles,' he thought with an odd smile. "'Hm, yes, all is in a man's hands, and he lets it all slip from cowardice. That's an axiom.' It would be interesting to know what it is men are most afraid of. Taking a new step, uttering a new word is what they fear most. But I am talking too much. It's because I chatter that I do nothing. Or perhaps it is that I chatter because I do nothing. I've learned to chatter this last month, lying for days together in my den thinking, of Jack the Giant Killer. Why am I going there now? Am I capable of that? Is that serious? It is not serious at all. It's simply a fantasy to amuse myself, a plaything. Yes, maybe it is a plaything. The heat in the street was terrible, and the airlessness, the bustle and the plaster, scaffolding, bricks and dust all about him, and that special Petersburg stench, so familiar to all who are unable to get out of town in summer all worked painfully upon the young man's already overwrought nerves. The insufferable stench from the pothouses, which are particularly numerous in that part of the town, and the drunken men whom he met continually, although it was a working day, completed the revolting misery of the picture. An expression of the profoundest disgust gleamed for a moment in the young man's refined face. He was, by the way, exceptionally handsome, above the average in height slim, well-built, with beautiful dark eyes and dark brown hair. Soon he sank into deep thought, or more accurately speaking, into a complete blankness of mind. He walked along not observing what was about him, and not caring to observe it. From time to time he would mutter something, from the habit of talking to himself, to which he had just confessed. At these moments he would become conscious that his ideas were sometimes in a tangle, and that he was very weak. For two days he had scarcely tasted food. He was so badly dressed that even a man accustomed to shabbiness would have been ashamed to be seen in the street in such rags. In that quarter of the town, however, scarcely any shortcoming in dress would have created surprise. Owing to the proximity of the haymarket, the number of establishments of bad character, the preponderance of the trading and working-class population crowded in these streets and alleys in the heart of Petersburg, types so various were to be seen in the streets 
that no figure, however queer, would have caused surprise. But there was such accumulated bitterness and contempt in the young man's heart, that, in spite of all the fastidiousness of youth, he minded his rags least of all in the street. It was a different matter when he met with acquaintances or with former fellow-students, whom, indeed, he disliked meeting at any time. And yet, when a drunken man, who for some unknown reason was being taken somewhere in a huge wagon dragged by a heavy dray horse, suddenly shouted at him as he drove past, "'Hey there, German Hatter!' bawling at the top of his voice and pointing at him, the young man stopped suddenly and clutched tremulously at his hat. It was a tall round hat from Zimmermann's, but completely worn out, rusty with age, all torn and bespattered, brimless and bent on one side in a most unseemly fashion. Not shame, however, but quite another feeling akin to terror had overtaken him. "'I knew it,' he muttered in confusion. "'I thought so. That's the worst of all. Why, a stupid thing like this! the most trivial detail might spoil the whole plan. Yes, my hat is too noticeable. It looks absurd, and that makes it noticeable. With my rags I ought to wear a cap, any sort of old pancake, but not this grotesque thing. Nobody wears such a hat. It would be noticed a mile off. It would be remembered. What matters is that people would remember it, and that would give them a clue. For this business one should be as little conspicuous as possible. Trifles, trifles are what matter. Why, it's just such trifles that always ruin everything." He had not far to go. He knew indeed how many steps it was from the gate of his lodging-house, exactly seven hundred and thirty. He had counted them once when he had been lost in dreams. At the time he had put no faith in those dreams and was only tantalizing himself by their hideous but daring recklessness. Now, a month later, he had begun to look upon them differently, and in spite of the monologues in which he jeered at his own impotence and indecision, he had involuntarily come to regard this hideous dream as an exploit to be attempted, although he still did not realize this himself. He was positively going now for a rehearsal of his project, and at every step his excitement grew more and more violent. With a sinking heart and a nervous tremor, he went up to a huge house which on one side looked on to the canal, and on the other into the street. This house was let out in tiny tenements, and was inhabited by working people of all kinds, tailors, locksmiths, cooks, Germans of sorts, girls picking up a living as best they could, petty clerks, etc. There was a continual coming and going through the two gates and in the two courtyards of the house. Three or four doorkeepers were employed on the building. The young man was very glad to meet none of them, and at once slipped unnoticed through the door on the right and up the staircase. It was a back staircase, dark and narrow, but he was familiar with it already and knew his way, and he liked all these surroundings. In such darkness even the most inquisitive eyes were not to be dreaded. If I am so scared now, what would it be if it somehow came to pass that I were really going to do it?" he could not help asking himself as he reached the fourth story. There his progress was barred by some porters who were engaged in moving furniture out of a flat. He knew that the flat had been occupied by a German clerk in the civil service and his family. This German was moving out, then and so the fourth floor on this staircase would be untenanted except by the old woman. That's a good thing, anyway, he thought to himself, as he rang the bell of the old woman's flat. The bell gave a faint tinkle as though it were made of tin and not of copper. The little flats in such houses always have bells that ring like that. He had forgotten the note of that bell, and now its peculiar tinkle seemed to remind him of something and to bring it clearly before him. He started, his nerves were terribly overstrained by now. In a little while the door was opened a tiny crack. The old woman eyed her visitor with evident distrust through the crack, and nothing could be seen but her little eyes, glittering in the darkness. But seeing a number of people on the landing she grew bolder, and opened the door wide. 
the young man stepped into the dark entry, which was partitioned off from the tiny kitchen. The old woman stood facing him in silence and looking inquiringly at him. She was a diminutive, withered-up old woman of sixty, with sharp malignant eyes and a sharp little nose. Her colorless, somewhat grizzled hair was thickly smeared with oil, and she wore no kerchief over it. Round her thin long neck, which looked like a hen's leg, was knotted some sort of flannel rag, and in spite of the heat there hung flapping on her shoulders a mangy fur cape, yellow with age. The old woman coughed and groaned at every instant. The young man must have looked at her with a rather peculiar expression, for a gleam of mistrust came into her eyes again. Raskolnikov, a student, I came here a month ago," the young man made haste to mutter, with a half-bow, remembering that he ought to be more polite. "'I remember it, my good sir. I remember quite well your coming here,' the old woman said distinctly, still keeping her inquiring eyes on his face. "'And here, I am again on the same errand.' Raskolnikov continued, a little disconcerted and surprised at the old woman's mistrust. Perhaps she is always like that, though, only I did not notice it the other time, he thought with an uneasy feeling. The old woman paused, as though hesitating, then stepped on one side, and pointing to the door of the room, she said, letting her visitor pass in front of her, "'Step in, my good sir.' The little room into which the young man walked, with yellow paper on the walls, geraniums and muslin curtains in the windows, was brightly lighted up at that moment by the setting sun. So the sun will shine like this then, too, flashed as it were by chance through Raskolnikov's mind, and with a rapid glance he scanned everything in the room, trying as far as possible to notice and remember its arrangement. But there was nothing special in the room. The furniture, all very old and of yellow wood, consisted of a sofa with a huge bent wooden back, an oval table in front of the sofa, a dressing-table with a looking-glass fixed on it between the windows, chairs along the walls, and two or three halfpenny prints in yellow frames, representing German damsels with birds in their hands. That was all. In the corner a light was burning before a small icon. Everything was very clean. The floor and the furniture were brightly polished. Everything shone. Lizaveta's work, thought the young man. There was not a speck of dust to be seen in the whole flat. It's in the houses of spiteful old widows that one finds such cleanliness, Raskolnikov thought again, and he stole a curious glance at the cotton curtain over the door leading into another tiny room, in which stood the old woman's bed and chest of drawers, and into which he had never looked before. These two rooms made up the whole flat. "'What do you want?' the old woman said severely, coming into the room and, as before, standing in front of him so as to look him straight in the face. "'I've brought something to pawn here,' and he drew out of his pocket an old-fashioned flat silver watch, on the back of which was engraved a globe. The chain was of steel. "'But the time is up for your last pledge. The month was up the day before yesterday.' I will bring you the interest for another month. Wait a little. But that's for me to do as I please, my good sir, to wait or to sell your pledge at once." "'How much will you give me for the watch, Alyona Ivanovna?' "'You come with such trifles, my good sir. It's scarcely worth anything. I gave you two roubles last time for your ring, and one could buy it quite new at a jeweler's for a rouble and a half. Give me four roubles for it, I shall redeem it. It was my father's. I shall be getting some money soon." "'A rouble and a half, and interest in advance, if you like.' "'A rouble and a half!' cried the young man. "'Please yourself.' And the old woman handed him back the watch. The young man took it, and was so angry that he was on the point of going away, but checked himself at once remembering that there was nowhere else he could go, and that he had had another object also in coming. "'Hand it over,' he said roughly. The old woman fumbled in her pocket for her keys, and disappeared behind the curtain into the other room. The young man, left standing alone in the middle of the room, listened inquisitively, thinking. 
he could hear her unlocking the chest of drawers. It must be the top drawer, he reflected. So she carries the keys in a pocket on the right, all in one bunch on a steel ring. And there's one key there, three times as big as all the others, with deep notches. That can't be the key of the chest of drawers. Then there must be some other chest or strong box. That's worth knowing. Strong boxes always have keys like that. But how degrading it all is! The old woman came back. Here, sir, as we say, ten kopecks the rouble a month. So I must take fifteen kopecks from a rouble and a half for the month in advance. But for the two roubles I lent you before, you owe me now twenty kopecks on the same reckoning in advance. That makes thirty-five kopecks altogether. So I must give you a rouble and fifteen kopecks for the watch. Here it is. What? Only a rouble and fifteen kopecks now? Just so. The young man did not dispute it and took the money. He looked at the old woman and was in no hurry to get away, as though there was still something he wanted to say or to do, but he did not himself quite know what. I may be bringing you something else in a day or two, Alyona Ivanovna, a valuable thing, silver, a cigarette box, as soon as I get it back from a friend. He broke off in confusion. Well, we will talk about it then, sir. Goodbye. Are you always at home alone? Your sister is not here with you? He asked her as casually as possible as he went out into the passage. What business is she of yours, my good sir? Oh, nothing particular, I simply asked. You are too quick. Good day, Alyona Ivanovna. Raskolnikov went out in complete confusion. This confusion became more and more intense. As he went down the stairs, he even stopped short two or three times, as though suddenly struck by some thought. When he was in the street, he cried out, Oh, God! How loathsome it all is! And can I, can I possibly? No, it's nonsense, it's rubbish," he added resolutely. And how could such an atrocious thing come into my head? What filthy things my heart is capable of! Yes, filthy above all, disgusting, loathsome, loathsome! And for a whole month I've been— But no words, no exclamations could express his agitation. The feeling of intense repulsion, which had begun to oppress and torture his heart while he was on his way to the old woman, had by now reached such a pitch and had taken such a definite form that he did not know what to do with himself to escape from its wretchedness. He walked along the pavement like a drunken man, regardless of the passers-by, and jostling against them, and only came to his senses when he was in the next street. Looking round he noticed that he was standing close to a tavern which was entered by steps leading from the pavement to the basement. At that instant two drunken men came out at the door, and abusing and supporting one another they mounted the steps. Without stopping to think, Raskolnikov went down the steps at once. Till that moment he had never been into a tavern, but now he felt giddy and was tormented by a burning thirst. He longed for a drink of cold beer and attributed his sudden weakness to the want of food. He sat down at a sticky little table in a dark and dirty corner, ordered some beer, and eagerly drank off the first glassful. At once he felt easier, and his thoughts became clear. "'All that's nonsense,' he said hopefully. "'And there's nothing in it at all to worry about. It's simply physical derangement. Just a glass of beer, a piece of dry bread, and in one moment the brain is stronger, the mind is clearer, and the will is firm. Phew! How utterly petty it all is!" But in spite of this scornful reflection, he was by now looking cheerful as though he were suddenly set free from a terrible burden, and he gazed round in a friendly way at the people in the room. But even at that moment he had a dim foreboding that this happier frame of mind was also not normal. There were few people at the time in the tavern. Besides the two drunken men he had met on the steps, a group consisting of about five men and a girl with a concertina had gone out at the same time. Their departure left the room quiet and rather empty. 
The persons still in the tavern were a man who appeared to be an artisan, drunk, but not extremely so, sitting before a pot of beer, and his companion, a huge stout man with a grey beard, in a short, full-skirted coat. He was very drunk, and had dropped asleep on the bench. Every now and then he began as though in his sleep, cracking his fingers, with his arms wide apart and the upper part of his body bounding about on the bench, while he hummed some meaningless refrain, trying to recall some such lines as these. His wife a year he fondly loved, his wife a, a year he fondly loved. Or suddenly waking up again, walking along the crowded row, he met the one he used to know. But no one shared his enjoyment. His silent companion looked with positive hostility and mistrust at all these manifestations. There was another man in the room who looked somewhat like a retired government clerk. He was sitting apart, now and then sipping from his pot and looking round at the company. He, too, appeared to be in some agitation. End of Part 1 Chapter 1